This is our review for chapter 12, and we are turning back now to where we were in chapter 8. So, chapters 9, 10, and 11 all looked at um, comparing prior information to current information. Have I deviated from the past? In chapter 8, and the few chapters before that, we were looking at odd behavior in subsets, and we're back to this again. We are talking about drilling down and looking for anomalous um, types of activities within subsets, and these subsets are small groups of transactions. I end up calling these uh, subsets a forensic unit, and the forensic unit could, for example, be a store in a chain of stores, a frequent flyer account amongst an airline's uh, thousands of frequent flyer accounts, a bank account amongst the bank's many bank accounts, a vendor somebody that supplies services amongst many vendors, or as I've done before, I've analyzed coupon claims. And you know the coupons I'm talking about are these 50 cents off or $1 off coupon claims against a manufacturer of types of things that you find in retail stores. So let's uh, get down and uh, do a little introduction here. Risk scoring. I'm talking about using predictors that indicate some or other attribute or behavior of interest. We do this with students. Um, I use tests, cases, quizzes, presentations, attendance as predictors of, of um, being a good student. Uh, here I have some other examples. We score each forensic unit for its risk of a specific type of fraud or error, but we, we, we do so even out of context of fraud or errors. For example, uh, when buying a house, you will score each of the houses that you look at based on what type of house you like. When you buy a car, you have a number of things that you look at, including a budget, and you'll score the car based on the things that you like. Uh, spending a Saturday night, what to do on it, you'll score each of the alternatives and you'll end up with your favored um, activity. So, a forensic unit is one of the subunits that together constitute the whole. I don't know whether that sentence says anything. Um, and these are the unit whose behaviors of interest we are analyzing. We combine the scores from several predictors. The house, there would be numerous factors that you will take into account when buying a house. So. Scores are calculated. Higher scores reflect a higher risk of fraud. For each predictor, zero means a low risk of errors and one, a high risk of errors, but just a high risk of errors. Each predictor was weighted, therefore, somewhere from one to zero. The result is uh, each predictor um, is scored from zero to one, and then I give them a weight, all the weight summing to one, according to its perceived importance. And the same with uh, scoring students, tests, cases, quizzes, presentations, and attendance and the like are each scored according to their perceived importance. The result is a final risk score. The higher, the closer we are to one, the higher the risk. And for students, the closer we are to 100%, the closer we rate them as a good student. Um, Dun -dun -dun. Now, I'm talking about if you have a high budget and the stakes are high, we can do what the IRS did some 20 years ago. They had something called the Taxpayer Compliance Measurement Program. And what they wanted to do was they would sample some 50,000 taxpayers every three years. And then they would look at the attributes of those tax returns where the taxpayer was they would use the word non-compliant. Then they would develop a model and look for other tax returns that had those same attributes because those would presumably be the ones with a higher risk of tax evasion or non-compliance, as they might put it. Well, they have to develop a system to select the tax returns for audit. They have to have a system for uh, to monitor the progress of the audit. You can't have these audits taking eight years. They have to do this every three years and things have to be done on time. 
They have an audit check sheet which shows the reported and the corrected amounts for all the line items. The check sheet could also lead to other data that could lead to operational improvements. This check sheet was comprehensive. This tax audit for each taxpayer was comprehensive. Some people likened it to an autopsy without the benefit of death. They had to train the auditors. The selected tax returns had to be audited. Everything had to be put into a database. The database had to be accurate and consistent. And only then did they use discriminant analysis to try and discriminate between compliant and, as they would put it, non-compliant. So, they're talking about a huge cost here, and there were more than this more than just the cost of the audit. And what happens is when they spend a huge amount of uh, act effort auditing 54,000 tax returns, they are then random tax returns. They are then not auditing 54,000 tax returns that look um, as if they might have some tax evasion. Um, sample size below 50,000. So I said it was 50,000. It sounds as if it hovered around 50,000. Anyway, lots of people had many concerns and that program has since been discontinued. Victor's case is a prime one where this risk scoring on vendors might have worked. Victor worked for a large oil company and if you look at the logo over there, you might be able to guess which one it was. So, this was Victor's scheme. Open the post office box. And amazingly, this PO box was in a post, in a post office in the basement of the head office. Open a bank account in the name of SNS Designs. Prepare invoices from SNS Designs and send them to BP in the mail. Tell your assistant to prepare a check request so that a check would be prepared to pay the invoice. So he approved the invoice and the assistant was told to prepare a check request. Give your other assistant all the details. So what's actually happening here? He's feeding the assistant with all the details needed to make the payment. And it almost looks as if the assistant is approving the payment as opposed to him. He signs it. Instruct the system to send the check request using fax machine to the company's check processing center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I spent some time, I think around uh, 20 years ago, doing an analysis of corporate data. But here's the problem. Using fax machine opens you up to a charge of wire fraud. Collect the checks from the post office box and deposit the money into the bank account of SNS Design. Then take the SNS Design money, spend it as you like. Do this over a period of nine years for 3.1 million. Live the high life. Here's a problem. One day you retire. SNS suddenly stops doing business with the company and you have a successor. And in this case, the successor started nosing around, which led to Victor's demise. This was the P.O. box in the basement of the head office. And this was the exact P.O. box that uh, Victor used in his scheme. And once again, the fax machine opens you to a charge of wire fraud. Using this opens you to a charge of mail fraud. This is the prestigious head office, the head office building, and it was indeed in the basement over here that Victor had his um, post office box. So Victor was a controller at a satellite office on the outskirts of Chicago. He would come to the head office regularly for meetings with the top brass, and what he would do is when he was finished with this meeting, he would pop down to the basement to collect his check, his fraud check, uh, one of the ones that ended up totaling $3 million. Well, we're going to hear from three people here. The first is the lawyer. And the lawyer is talking and he's saying, Your Honor, so he's addressing the judge. 
and he's talking about bringing a cashier's check made out to BP America for 803000 Well, this is, of course, in partial settlement. Um, any fraudsters out there, by the way, that partial payment will do nothing to reduce your sentence. When you've stolen the money, as in shoplifting, when you've stolen it, you've stolen it. Giving half of it back, or in this case, looks like a quarter of it back, not going to uh, help with the sentence. Now, we talk about a two-level increase. There is a sentencing guidelines. We're talking about various levels. In the previous chapter, we, I talked about Catherine Harrell. I knew how many levels she would get, and she would probably get 46 months. She ended up getting 70 months. But now they talk about a two-level increase for sophistication, using sophisticated means. And the lawyer brings up a reasonably valid argument here. The argument is you can't steal 3.1 million without using a sophisticated method. So don't use the 3.1 million in determining the sentence plus sophisticated method. Um, here's the one problem. At sentencing, it's too late. Bringing these arguments up now, when all these calculations have been done, too late. Let's hear from another party. Victor himself, my sincere apologies. How passionately I can say. He talks about his daughters. He talks about his estranged wife. Again, he talks about his daughters. He talks about deeply regretting the situation. Not Mike the situation. We did Mike the situation last chapter. He's talking about this fraud situation. They all deeply regret the situation on sentencing date. I have seen people in tears in federal court. And last, let's hear from the judge. And this is quite telling. I find sentencing somebody of your age very difficult because these should be your golden years. Now they talk about why we sentence people. And he's only giving two of the reasons here. There are more. One is specific deterrence. We need the sentence to deter you from going out and committing another crime. And he says, I don't think this is an issue with his age and with this uh, rap. Uh, he's not going to be going out and doing it again. But here is the other objective, and this is terribly important. The sentence also has to provide general deterrence. That is, it has to be sufficient to deter others from going out and committing sentence similar crimes. And if we talk about the college admission scandal, this is what Lachlan and Mossimo seem to be forgetting. Their sentence is going to be primarily there to deter others from going out and committing similar crimes. It's a high load of publicity, and this is indeed one of the main objectives. One of the other objectives is when somebody is extremely dangerous, we, uh, we put them away uh, so as to uh, help with the safety of others. So with the college admission scandal, the main objective there to deter others from going out and committing these crimes. Uh, he got sentenced to 63 months. Now, here's an example. We could score vendors. And indeed, what I would have enjoyed seeing was a done an analysis on that SNS designs and had BP run this proactively, they might have come up with the fact that SNS designs looked exactly like a fraud vendor. Number one, my first predictor. I think that a fraud vendor would not have too many invoices per month and not too few. Too many means each time is risky, don't overdo it, and by overdo it I mean 50 or something like that. There would be no credits, adjustments and reversals because this is all phony and there's going to be nothing to correct. Uh, those SNS design invoices, Victor would have approved them. He would not have approved them and then had a, a resulting credit. All these things like credits and adjustments draw attention to the vendor. High growth. They don't know when to stop. We had the largest subsets growth test and it was slightly before 
chapter 9. I forget the exact chapter number. I think fraudsters would generally try to stay in a fraud range. Not too big, not too small. So what I will do, if you're in the range, 5,000 to 500,000, I think you're pretty much in that range. You will get a higher score than if you were outside of that. Fraudsters like to use round numbers, and we saw that in the previous chapter, where Catherine Harrell had all those withdrawal from the bank accounts, round numbers. What's coming up uh, in the next chapter, uh, Harriet Walters, round numbers. Rita Cronwell in a previous chapter, round numbers. So this is just a basic one. We could actually develop a scoring model based on these five predictors. We have other predictors over here, which we could use as well, and we could get more and more complicated. One thing that I have found is if you've never done this thing before, just start with something basic. You don't have to split the atom. You don't have to need to program in Fortran or something absolutely uh, difficult. Keep it simple. Do it in Access. Do it in Excel. If it's your first time, the payment payoff should be high. Now, when the real action begins is in the end of chapter examples. And here I have case 12.1. So you can look at my review, my video to review this. But indeed, what I do is I look at the city of Somerville data. And here we have check payments for four calendar years. We have the vendor name. We have the amount. We have the check date, check number. And we have a whole other uh, score of attributes of interest um, to the right over there. And what I want to do is I want you to actually create a vendor scoring model and rank each vendor according to its fraud risk, but I'm just making things up. I'm not assuming anything actually happened in the city of Somerville. And here we go. We're going to have four predictors, one based on the percentage increase from 2015 to 2016, one based on the total dollars for 2016, one based on the number of invoices for 2016, and one based on the day of the week that the checks were processed. I ask you to weight each predictor. I want you to show me the first 20 rows of your results. And so if you are interested in seeing uh, risk scoring absolutely in action, you can simply go to my guidance video for case 12.1, and I will walk through this step by step until we end up with a final result. So. I'm here, it's in the chapter, let's move on to continuous monitoring. So, we do continuous monitoring in many facets of our life. The perimeters of prisons, continuously monitored. Those machines in hospitals, continuously monitored. We see TV, people running towards a room, that's because some alert has been set off that a number on the machine has moved above or below a good range. Our water supply, continuously monitored. We have lots of things that are continuously monitored. Why don't we do more continuous monitoring of financial transactions? Well, if we did, this would be the approach. Determine the scope, methods and techniques. Exactly what am I going to monitor and which methods am I going to use? Create the predictors or the performance measurement indicators. Track exceptional events. Separate ad hoc, which means from time to time, from the regular monitoring. Subsequent corrective actions, management reporting. This is a really nice timeline if you're starting off and you want to set up some type of continuous monitoring system. Uh, we do continuous monitoring informally as well. When I teach a class, I like to look at the online statistics. I like to look at the grade calculations. I want to see how the class is doing. I want to see how many people have submitted um, before the due date and, and things like that. We monitor. Why don't we monitor financial transactions? So in the book, I talk about uh, uh, 
a franchisee and we monitored the sales reports of the franchisees, that's because they pay a franchise fee. And that fee depends on their sales numbers. And if they understate their sales numbers, they will understate what they are legally obligated to pay. And what I did was I developed a really comprehensive model that looked at a number of indicators to indicate whether a franchisee might be cheating on their numbers. So my indicators were in a number of categories. Number one, motivation. How motivated are you to actually pay what you should pay? And one thing that would detract from you being motivated is if you had a cash crunch. If I can't measure exactly what I want to measure, maybe something else would give me a better answer. So I can't actually measure whether the franchisee is in a cash crunch, but I can measure whether they are paying me on time. And if they are not, that might be a motivation indicator, or it might be an indicator that they are having a cash crunch. I look at values that fluctuate a lot. I looked at values that changed a lot. I looked at values moving in a direction opposite to expected. For example, if sales go up, then it would be odd if food costs go down. I look at numbers that are just particularly high. I have some special situations, <coughs> for example, location. And I didn't get that all that right in this application, but I would if I did it future applications. I like to have a prior score. I like to have a memory of how, how high were your scores in the past, and I want to bring in a factor. If you had a high score in the past, it's going to count against you in the present. It's almost like a naughty student at school. When they get called into the uh, principal's office for the fifth time, the punishment will be much harsher than if it was their first time. That is because the school principal has a memory of the prior four times, and they might say to themselves, you know, I need to do some deterrence as well. Our legal system is extremely uh, keen on prior scores. If it's your first offense, the sentence is more lenient than if it was your third. And we even have words for that, three strikes and you're out. Now, I did this in Access and I used a switchboard. I'm keeping their name a little secret over there. Um, but what I did was a switchboard. And the nice thing is this is sort of a form and somebody that has no clue how Access works can simply click here and the reports will pop up. This one here means go to the next page. There's the next page and we have all these scores over here. So somebody can click and you simply click there and the report gets produced. No need to do any coding or no need to even see the underlying database. Summary. Risk scoring works well in a continuous monitoring environment. My predictors are indicators of something that I'm interested in. The predictors are like cues or red flags. The unit is the entity being scored. It could be a bank account. And I did a scoring uh, application in the early 2000s where each bank account was scored as to its propensity to be a check kiting scheme. Check kiting is where people draw on uncollected funds in their bank accounts and they do so intentionally. Examples include vendors, fast food restaurants, operating divisions, travel agents. I've done this before. Uh, purchasing card holders. It works well when we score many forensic units because what we do is we get the final score and we look at those with the highest score. This indicate also works for every single credit card purchase that you do. When I go to my local Kroger and when I spend $56.32, that transaction gets scored in a fraction of a second and the bank will accept the payment because that looks exactly like what I spend at my local Kroger's. Every transaction is scored and uh, why we are surprised that it gets scored is because it's done in less than a second. We have a final risk score between zero and one, and it reflects that the forensic unit has engaged in whatever the behavior of interest was. 
And here we need specific behaviors of interest. You can't sort of be waffly about this. If you're waffly about this, you're really not going to be able to get um, predictors. Our goal is a small set of ordered targets that are at a high risk for fraud or errors. And indeed, this is an iterative process. When I did the travel agents, we went over and over and over again until we got a small set of order targets that were a high risk for fraud or errors. Indeed, this data set was so large, maybe 100 million records, that what we did was we created a small data set, maybe 2 million records. And when we were programming and when we were getting the predictors to work and checking that the reports and everything looked nice, we ran all our tests against the 2 million records, kept running against the 2 million records because running against the 2 million records was a matter of seconds. Then when all was said and done and we had a small set of audit target from the 2 million records, then we ran it on the 100 million records. And I like this chapter. That is indeed the end of chapter 12. And I wish you luck uh, in doing the case. And I wish you luck in um, risk scoring in your private life. And so from me to you, it's bye-bye.